Hi, Will Gethin here. Welcome to episode six of Folly or Blisters, the Hero's Journey podcast. The guest for this final episode of series one is Eva Hamilton MBE, founder and CEO of Key for Life, an extraordinary charity that rehabilitates ex-offenders using equine therapy, turning around the lives of some of the most disaffected young men in Britain. Key for Life builds on Eva's charitable work in support of marginalized sectors of society over 35 years. Setting up the Seniors Believing program with the Prince of Wales, she took 600 of Britain's top business leaders into deprived inner city areas, and other charitable projects include supporting homeless people back into employment and helping war veterans recover from trauma. In this interview, we uncover Eva's journey from wayward teenager called to a life of service and Mother Teresa's home for the dying through many trials and traumas right through to her celebrated work today, helping ex-offenders to move through their pain and recover their lives using a programme drawing on her own rich life experience. I hope you enjoy the journey. Hey Eva. Hey, Will. <laughs> <laughs> great to see you. Great to be back here at 12 Hides. It's great to be having you with us. And uh, I remember when I came here for, uh, well, we actually met, of course, we met at a Christmas concert that my partner, Eloise, was having. And uh, we swapped cards when we discovered what we both did. And uh, you invited me to a meeting at 12 Hides here. And uh, I didn't know what I was coming to an office and to just a fairly straight meeting or what it was. But you said it was, uh, there was a filming workshop that I should maybe attend at the same time. But I, I turned up, you were on a horse, on a horse sort of out in the front. And uh, I was escorted into the sitting room. And then next thing I knew, I was being asked to go out and, and uh, join some horses and do some horse healing with uh, some horses, uh, some equine therapy. And then I was ushered back in the sitting room. And then suddenly there was sort of, a sort of maybe eight to ten uh, mm -hmm. former offenders and gangsters and gang leaders all sitting around having a discussion about knife crime. Right. And uh, I sat so furiously taking notes, not quite sure where this was going. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, I was about to leave because I had to get back to another meeting and you said, um, oh, no, well, before you go, you have to come and do some, um, some virtual reality. So I was then ushered off into probably this room or maybe yeah. next door and given this virtual reality headset and I had these, right. sort of, this gang on the back of some side street or around the corner of some side street sort of trying to lure me into their gang and I had to answer all these questions. That's and, right. Uh, it was I actually terrifyingly it. real, even though you know you're wearing a headset, you're kind of like, oh my God, this half feels a bit real. <laughs> and, the, and these characters are kind of, sort of slightly threatening you and you're like, ah. So yeah, that was a, it was a remarkable and fascinating introduction to, uh, to the, your charity, Key for Life. <laughs> And, um, and 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 to you and to you and what you do here oh, at thank uh, you, Will. Yeah, I remember Twelve Highs. I, well. I went away sort of whirling, well, was a whirring in my head. About <laughs> gosh, that was like this is something really, uh, something really exciting going on. And uh, in a way that you can see that's a, you know, it's a call to adventure in itself. You know, one of these sort of moments that comes along and it's like, Woof, what's happening here? Whoa, here we go. <laughs> anyway, love so it, um, love it, Will. It was yeah, certainly a call to adventure. Yeah. Right? So. Um, I know you've worked with the Heroes Journey before, yeah. one of your charities you worked on before, um, uh, called the Warrior Programme, I That's think it was. That's right, yeah. And uh, our mutual uh, friend and contact, Hugh Lillingston. Hugh, yes, uh, amazing Who, Hugh. strange enough, I met, um, at, rather, where well, he hosted me on a retreat in the desert in Morocco, uh, where I was introduced to the Heroes Journey back in yeah. about 2000, I think it was about 2006 or seven, And, uh, of course, it turns out that he... Did the hero's journey on your warrior program? That's right. It was a huge yeah. part of the warrior program. Yeah. yeah, very much so. So you're you're yeah. reasonably au fait with this this yeah. arc and, and the patterns of the journey. No, I love the hero's journey. Yeah, great. So, is there a specific sort of period of your life or a, or an, an arc, a hero's journey or heroine's journey arc that you want to work with Eva for this for yeah, this conversation? Well, I mean, I think my whole my life up until now has had all sorts of um, amazing heroes journey or heroines journey. But actually, I think where it, the, the the bit for me that was probably most interesting was where it started, where I got my calling, when I was at Mother Teresa's um, home for the dying in Calcutta, mm -hmm. and that was probably the start of it. I would have thought one of my starts of one of my great journeys. Yeah, so you were travelling yeah. in India. I think you were, you were 18, I think you, t you told me Yeah, this. no, I was, uh, you know, I say, yeah, uh, I was probably a little bit old, maybe 19, 20, and yeah. I had actually had a year in London, and I had decided that having spent a year being a secretary, it wasn't quite what I necessarily thought I was particularly good mm -hmm. at, and I felt I needed to break away. 
Um, and interestingly, and I'd had my challenges, I went with a great girlfriend around the world and India was our first port of call. And I was in Calcutta staying in a shelter um, in one of the YMCA's or Salvation Army. And I met this doctor who said, listen, I need to help. I'm in the home for the dying. Would any of you come down and help me? And I'm normally the sort of person that's not very good with blood. And I was normally the person that would say no. And that the friend I was with would say yes. So she said no. And I then <laughs> said yes. Um, and it was the most, uh, you know, extraordinary, life-changing experience of my life. So we were um, cleaning people and looking after people who were literally about to cross over, who were about to die. And it was the most humbling amazing experience of my life and um it was there actually that I got this kind of calling when I say it was a calling it was a very strong message came down telling me that I was never here and I wasn't going to make a lot of money while I was down here I was here to serve and better the world and at that point I didn't really understand what this message meant um you know little did I know what I was going on to do so yeah that was the start of it Wow. Then, yeah. So that was just an internal call. It's a sense that came up within you like, wow, this is what I've got to do. I've got to, yes. I've got to serve. I've got to do something meaningful with my life and help others. Help others. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And also seeing, I think, being in the home for the dying was really moving and meeting people who were in a shocking state. I, I'd never been as close to people, you know, who were about to die, but also seeing how many people were suffering from leprosy mm. on the streets of Calcutta. There's a lot of people really suffering. Mm. And I think when you get to India, you know, they're an extraordinary race of people. The India, I just am amazed, you know, the colour, the the, the the energy, but there's Absolutely. also huge yeah. deprivation yeah. as well. So even though it was extremely challenging and horrible at one level, you, you found it just a sense of really, really fulf a real fulfilment from, from being there and doing the work. That's right. And I think also for me, the spiritual side, which I hadn't really opened up on myself, was a big part of it, probably yeah. subconsciously. There was a lot going on being around Mother Teresa's energy. And, you know, there was just, it's a very spiritual place to be, India, you mm. know, on many, many levels. Funny enough, I, in, in some ways, I, I mean, I had, a, a, in some ways, many calls to venture around this particular time. But when I went to India myself mm -hmm. for the second time, but it was a big long trip I went on, which, yeah. was, which was where a lot of my own sort of main, I think of my main hero's journey happened. But I, mm -hmm. I was at a Buddhist retreat very early on in that particular trip. And um, I just remember the, the monk at the beginning, he was actually an Australian monk mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a sort of Indian Buddhist uh, retreat. But he, I remember him saying, you know, you guys here from the West, you will have you will have great health, you have intelligence, education, you have mm -hmm. far more than the vast majority of the world. What can you do to give back to people? And, and, that, and those words really stuck with me the whole trip. Beautiful. What can you get, do? Yeah, to like actually, you have so much privilege. Absolutely. What can you? What can you do? Yeah. That, that did stick with me. So it's like in a way that was not, uh, that was yeah. a calling. But there were lots of callings yeah. around that time. But that was definitely how just, wonderful. Well, I know. A similar one back. to yours in a sense. Yeah. 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 Um, so you you, um, you got the call, but maybe I don't know whether you, did you take that call straight away or did you? It did take a while for you to take the call up. Did you refuse the call? Do you think anyway? <laughs> well, did when you... I I think I was still in that sort of like wanting to be a free spirit and going off traveling, which I was traveling. Of and I had a great time. Went to Thailand and we went on to Australia. But I was, I suppose, in a way, I was quite wayward at times, and I did things and took things I shouldn't have taken. And in Australia, actually, I was working for an amazing man called Ken Doan. He's a famous artist. Anyway, uh, I remember one day he asked me to lift a television. And I said, I can't lift the television because I've had lung collapses because I'd already had three lung collapses. Wow. And I don't think he quite believed me. Anyway, he got me to lift the TV with somebody and suddenly my lung collapsed really badly, actually, my right lung. So I found myself in Sydney stuck for a couple of months, not really being able to move, not able to do much because you have to wait till your lung inflates. And that was, I think, a big moment for me because actually I realized maybe I was quite ill. So I actually ended up going on to Hawaii, then on to the States and seeing an ex-boyfriend in New York. Had a fabulous time, but the calling was I had to get back to Ireland, where I came from. Yeah. And when I got back eventually to Ireland, within a week I was in hospital and they went through, undertook a massive operation that I had a disease in my lungs and they had to cut out half my right lung. So that was, I think, God. even though I never quite believed I was that ill, it was a real shock 
to find myself in them and it was really painful as well because they put a drain in for two weeks so I was in hospital and they found this very rare disease in me called histiocytosis x which weirdly my father used to be a sheep farmer and they say you can get it from sheep dip so I don't know where or how I got it, but they managed to cut a lot of it out in my lung. So then I, you know, weirdly, I, I stayed in Ireland, convalesced, and then I couldn't wait to get back to London. But of course, I wasn't allowed to do much. So the woman I used to work with for that year before I went traveling was an amazing woman called Julia Cleverton, Dame Julia Cleverton. She's yeah. very well known, but one of the most influential business women and she was probably my you know she was my helper she came in I, she was like my mentor I worked to her and she put me into a typing pool at this new charity she was at called business of the community and I have to say I was useless at typing and didn't enjoy it but I had to because I couldn't do much and then she got me to come and be her PA and then out of nowhere Prince Charles came up with this who was the president it was the time um, when a lot of businesses were collapsing and he said what we need to do is get more businesses in Britain to be actually engaging in their communities and he came up with this concept of seeing as believing and at right place right time I was very very lucky and I was at the age of 23 I was given this incredible opportunity to run his program the Prince of Wales the seeing as believing program and I took out probably about 600 of the most influential top business people in Britain into some of the most deprived areas in Britain. So we'd go to housing estates throughout the country. We'd go to homeless projects. We'd go to inner city schools. We'd go and meet the IRA. You name it, we did it. And that was my real... I did, couldn't quite believe that I was doing what I was doing and meeting such extraordinary people and affecting change on the ground, which was... So what, this what was, was, yeah, this was the, 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 the sudden realisation of the call and flying into the... Absolutely. Everything happening really fast. Everything happened. Being, happened. being completely on track, yeah. You're so right. It was synchronicity. Yeah. It was amazing. It was just... I'm such a privilege to work with Prince of Wales, who's such an amazing man. And I went out a lot with him on visits across the country. So it was a, it was an amazing... The whole thing was an amazing experience. It sounds like a sort of mini mini hero's journey in itself this you know sort of from the mother to raise through going all that through that sickness yeah. and then I mean, then coming through the other end through in, the in, other end in a sense that was a hero's journey itself but i know we're also getting into a bigger arc now but yeah. um but um just to get us a bit of context to um the the, the sort of the, the context and background before the call can you just mm. give me a little a little sort of very short summary of uh what life was like before say uh, the trip to India. Just yeah. You know, so I where, had... where you're at. What was life like for you? What what were your aspirations? What what, what had gone on? At yeah. That point? So I suppose I was quite. My father would always call me a bit of a wayward teenager. I always saw the good in life. I had my challenges, definitely, like a lot of people have. I think in school, you know, definitely, I went to a mixed school for my last two years. Having done well in an all girls school, I then got very distracted didn't do quite as well in my exams as I probably would have liked to so I never really wanted to go to university but what I did what I did do was I went to Paris and I went to the Sorbonne for a year How and wonderful. then it was amazing and I had unfortunately one moment there which wasn't great where I stupidly got into a taxi late one night and a man took me to the Bois de Boulogne and I'm very lucky basically to be alive and after a struggle of three hours, he drove me back and had told me I was a very lucky girl to be alive because he had killed a girl the previous my Saturday and that he'd never be traceable. So I have had my fair share of probably that was a very stupid move. But at the same time, it was it was a real wake up for me of, oh, my goodness. But I never told anyone. I hid it. I was repairing as well. When I woke up two hours later, I just thought it was all a nightmare. I didn't realise it was something that had really happened. Wow. Yeah. Which is why when you see the Sarah Everard and those awful things, it really hits me. And I know how vulnerable women can be, you know. Yeah. And there are, I'm afraid, some pretty dangerous people out there. Not a lot, but some. Yeah. It seems like you've you've had your fair share of trials and tribulations along yes. the way, Eva, for sure. Yeah, no, <laughs> I have, I have. But maybe that's why I do what I do now and where I am. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. So back to um, where we got to, which was on, on the road of the journey. You yeah. crossed the threshold. You were doing this amazing work with the Seeing's Believing Programme and the Prince mm -hmm. of Wales. Um, and that part of the journey um, is uh, about building strengths and resources and getting mm -hmm. new skills. Can you talk about any any sort of important strengths and resources or skills that you uh, collected at that time that were really helpful for 
be moving forward on the journey? Yeah, well, I think it was interesting. I think I did acquire some great skills because I learned some great things from all sorts of great people. But it also, for me, it when it went well, it went brilliantly for five years. But I became almost obsessed by my work to a point that I burnt myself out. So I think I learned some great things when I was good, to have confidence, to get out there, to realise I could do it. But what happened with me was I then started slipping and I started doubting myself and because I didn't go to university. I then started questioning why was I intelligent enough? And then I kept had questioning was I able to write, which was an extraordinary thing because I had to write speeches before. And then I started doubting myself. And it was that was after about five years of running the Prince's program. And I ended up not sleeping for the best part of a year. Um, and I have to be honest with you, it was that year was probably when I was 28, the most challenging and horrific time I think I've ever been through. Because what happens when you don't sleep is you become paranoid, you get mental, you get, you know, all sorts of crazy Absolute, things happen. Yeah. You think that people are... And I'd had a horrible thing happen to me many, many, many years ago when I was in Ireland to do with, um, you know, some of a terrorist group. And I, I, I was paranoid, basically. We were there when Matt Batten was killed. And I remember saying something once to somebody and I kind of thought they were coming back to get me. That's because I was obviously not well. And there was a lot of things that felt very real to me. Anyway, eventually I had to be put into a psychiatric unit in Dublin. And I think for me, and I remember it to, to every second of being in there, it was to me probably the most terrifying, scariest part of my entire life. Um, and I'd never had a depression before. And with the build up to going to hospital and not sleeping meant that I was just, I'd lost my confidence. I couldn't speak to people. I, and then by the time they got me in hospital, it still took them three weeks to get my drugs right. So as I would sleep. And then I put on about 11, I was up to about 11 stone. And I had a horrible incident, like I'd always been so scared of going into this hospital, this psychiatric unit in Dublin called St. Pat's, that in my first night there, I'll never forget it, two things happening. Firstly, my poor mum was playing a huge role in helping me. But when we got into the hospital, they put me into an open ward and she said, no, no, we can't possibly have her in an open ward. She needs her own bedroom. And it was when I was in my own bedroom, they then came in and asked me to come and join all the other people for tea in the afternoon. And I just went, no, I don't want to leave my room. Anyway, I got up and went out and this woman sat opposite me who was covered in face, in hair, facial hair all over her face. Wow. And because I was so paranoid, I thought she was a journalist or someone who was uh, spying on me. I remember leaning over trying to see if she was for real. And she was for real, obviously. Um, and then later that night, I was so scared. I sat upright in bed because I didn't sleep, terrified that somebody might come in and, and, and try and do anything to me. And at about three in the morning, this girl, Martina, came flying through and I hadn't met her, but jumped on me and went for my throat uh, oh and tried to literally strangle me. And Jesus. literally the next day, my husband, James, only just reminded somebody and told somebody the story yesterday that my mother and him came to visit me. And the same girl the next day, went running down the corridor and kicked my mother's basket and tried to go for them as well. So yes, it was probably one of the most terrifying moments of my life. And I was there for six weeks and eventually um, I, I, was, I got better, slept, um, but wouldn't talk. I wouldn't talk to any of them about any of my issues or why I found myself in that sort of space. So that was a really, really, really tricky for my husband because I at that time I wasn't married to him. And he'd come and visit me. And I kept telling the doctors I didn't want him in the hospital and could they remove him. So, yeah, it was it was pretty, pretty challenging. Well, this this sounds like we've sort of swiftly gone deep into the dark wood of the journey. Yeah, um, definitely dark wood, very dark. Uh, the place of death and rebirth and mm -hmm. and uh, of facing the sort of the, the biggest fear or obstacle on the journey. Did you, did you face a specific fear, do you think, on that, that you needed to, to really face down to um, to move through it? I think the biggest fear of failure and fear of not being good enough and the fear which was really that sort of ongoing theme that I didn't wasn't good enough and I didn't think I thought I was an awful person and I started seeing myself in a very 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 negative way so fear of everything was yeah. what was had overtaken my life yeah. of just existing yeah and so you needed to die to that that place of not not feeling good enough yeah, so that's that something new could come through. Uh, did you have to face 
sort of shadow aspects of yourself on that on that on that on that, pa- on that part. Yeah, there was yeah all sorts of. When I say shadow aspects, there was all sorts of shadow. It was everything from I once nicked a lipstick when I was in Paris and I got caught, and I remember thinking that was the worst thing that I'd ever done. And then anything I'd ever said to anyone that was negative, or if I'd ever been nasty to my sister, we used to argue a lot. Everything came to the surface about my shadow side, and that's yeah. exactly exactly as you describe it. That's exactly yeah. what was happening. So th- my helper, you know, though, was James, my husband, who at that point wasn't my husband, and it was him who, you know, when I came out, it was amazing. We ended up going to Prague for his birthday, and amazingly, because all my friends kept wondering why he was still sticking around, this girl is just in a psychiatric unit. She's 11 stone, and he proposed to me. So that was a couple of weeks after I came out of hospital. Oh, that's a, a suitable gift yeah. <laughs> for a, a woman who's been through to, to Helen back, isn't it? To Helen yeah. back, yeah. absolutely right. Yeah, well. that, that cheered you up a bit. It did, hugely. Well, I was amazed he even wanted to stick with me. I, don't, I think all my friends were too. Well, so, it's very admirable, yeah. isn't it, that he was prepared to, um, uh, yeah, at that point in your life yeah. to really embrace all that yeah, and, and be ready to be there for you and... Mm. And uh, protect you from from everything. That's right. See you That's through. Right. Yeah, good old James. <laughs> yes, he's amazing. He's still a rock. Um, and so, what do you feel was the treasure that came out of that that dark wood for you? What was there that any sort of personal was, breakthrough? Yeah, well, I think that I am valued, and I am a good person, and you know, that whatever I had been, all that negative stuff that I had to release you know, wasn't me and didn't serve me any longer. Um, I have to say, though, even though I did go on to get married, it was later that year that I had never discussed things like I've just told you about in Paris, that the demons did come back to haunt me in that November, so nine months later. Yes. And I then had to go back into hospital for a week and release a lot of what my pain and suffering was to the doctors. And they all said, we just couldn't believe that you were so brave. You'd been through so much. You hadn't slept for a year, but yet you were you wouldn't talk. And we knew there was a lot more behind you that you yeah. weren't saying. Yeah. So come November, I think the real breakthrough took place when I was able to open up and share some of the pain I'd been through. Yes. Yeah. And I think that I hadn't really finished it when I, and then I went on to get married and then it all came back to bite me a bit. It was like, no, you haven't been true to yourself. And even yeah. though certain people didn't want to hear what I had to say, there were certain things that had to be said. I think, yeah, from my experience, that's often the way, isn't it? You sort of, you deal with certain things, you think you've done a certain amount, but then there's always more, isn't it, that can come up at certain points in your, that's in your right. life journey and you have to sort of deal with them as they come up again. That's right. It's a constant process of of purification. Purification, that's yeah. absolutely right. Um, and so I think you also told me that you had, a, you had a new charity that sort of came out of that period as well, out of that. Yeah, so still at, with Business Community, I set up Business Action on Homelessness, the yeah. big homeless campaign and getting the homeless back to work, which actually has been strange because when I ran the Seeing as Believing Visits, with the prince, I used to find myself in tears in the loo with all these CEOs outside because I'd go to these homeless shelters and I'd meet people who were either like soldiers or a man who'd lost everything or a lovely woman that fallen on hard times and her family had abandoned her. She'd be on the streets or a young kid that was homeless. And I found that absolutely just devastating to see in our society and, you know, the UK, look where we are. We all have, you know, we're so lucky, all, most of us, with money and roofs over our heads that so really. many people could be on the streets yeah. who'd been really affluent and done really well. And how could they possibly be on the streets? I found that so difficult to deal with. So that's what really got me going about homelessness. And I teamed up with some other people and then I launched Business Action on Homelessness. So initially we kind of were looking at how could we help the homeless? We did the very traditional things that most people were doing, recycling, looking at, you know, all sorts of helping people with gifts in kind, etc. But then in 2000, having run it for two or three years, I think my major gift really in this whole cycle was that I was on another experience where I was in Bristol and I met four people injecting their feet with heroin because it was the last veins left in their body. 
And I had the most extraordinary moment where I was on a train going from Bristol to London with somebody from BT. And I had one of my light bulb moments that if children can go and work experience, why don't I apply the same to the homeless? So I got back to London, approached a whole raft of companies, BT, Reuters, Virgin Records, and said, will you offer some rough sleepers work placements? Everyone thought it was a crazy idea, said it won't work. Anyway, we put 14 out and 13 out of 14 completed two-week placements from the streets, did brilliantly. Marks and Spencer heard about it, phoned me and said, oh my goodness, we can't believe what you've done. We'd like to offer you half a million pounds and a thousand work placements. So I was like, oh my God, a thousand, I've only done 14. So we negotiated on 600 and we rolled that program out to 23 cities, which was absolutely that's incredible, isn't it? Wow, well done. Yeah. Often at the um, return, at the sort of treasure and return stage of the journey um, on the heroine's journey can be about integrating um, for the woman at the, the lost feminine side. Like, so mm. I don't know if you've ever read Maureen Murdoch's The, Hero- the, Her- the Heroine's Journey. No. She talks about I've how... I've heard of it, but I haven't read it. She, You've just prompted me to you, She it. talks about how a woman often tries to sort of fit in and make, be successful in a man's world. So they take on all these, develop these male, the male attributes and then mm-hmm. they, they, they succeed and then they're left feeling really empty because they've mm-hmm. actually sort of abandoned and left behind their integral sort of female essence. So they then have to go on this journey to reclaim their feminine, their primal feminine, um, and then sort of find their balance between the two. And I should imagine that you've uh, worked a lot in the man's world through your, your charity work. Uh, not least with your current charity, Key for Life, where you're surrounded yeah. by men. And, yes. Um, but uh, have you found that, that that's been a sort of interesting part of your own journey, to, to dealing with that balance between the male and female aspects in a man's world, as a woman in a man's world? Yeah, you know, I think you make such a good point. I think there's, I, ha- I have to say I found I had some really challenging times at Business the Community with some of the um, men that I worked with. They did not like the fact that I was this strong woman, very... Um, determined and knew what I wanted because when you worked at business the community there were loads of different field directors and field people and so they didn't like if I went into their region so or I do or I was strong against them so I found I came up sometimes with some resistance from people who didn't like the fact that I was out there just wanting to make a difference yeah how I've always measured my own success really is all about what do you actually do on the ground and I used to get frustrated if there was too much talking. I'm, a, I'm very action-oriented. Yeah. And I think the feminine side of me, I at times had to not suppress, but, you know, I've always had to be, I suppose, strong and tough, which actually is not necessarily what I'm really about deep down. I'm actually yeah. much more soft and uh, more volatile and vulnerable than people see, you know. Yeah. No, you have a soft, um, big heart, Eva. But you, I guess you have to have to take on those <laughs> those, 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 those guys, those as other well. attributes, yeah to, yeah, to 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 beat those men down <laughs> <laughs> when needed. That's right, particularly the naughty ones I'm dealing with at the moment, eh? Hey? Um, and so, moving sort of into the return of the journey, um, I know that you were inspired to, to kickstart Key for Life when you when you um, when you witnessed the London riots happening and all these kids getting involved in knife crime. That's right. That's absolutely right. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, having spent 20 years at Business of the Community, then I actually went on to do the Warrior Programme with the soldiers, which is where I met yeah. Hugh, and all of that was fantastic. Uh, then I decided, actually, much as I loved the military, it was time to move on. And you're right, the, the, that was an incredible for me. And, and I think this last part, this last journey has been really interesting. Um for the very reason that when the riots took place and I saw children as young as eight rioting, I just thought something had to be done. But I had come out of Warrior and I had not, I didn't have a specific purpose, but I like to be driven by kind of, you know, knowing I'm here on this planet to do something. And I think when I left Warrior, I was so exhausted. I had a bit of a burnout um, and it hadn't been very easy the last few months that what happened was that when I was here with my wonderful children, Emily and Ali, 
who, you know, are huge, huge along with James part of my life. And, you know, I'm very lucky to have them. I went through a huge low and it's very difficult when you're a mum. And I found it very difficult because it was sort of haunted. My past came back to bite me a bit from when I was in that psychiatric unit. I was really struggling to sleep. I was struggling to get up in the morning and I was feeling very low. And it was actually the only time that I really felt in the day that I was actually more normal was when I went to my horses. Um, and every time I went to my horse, in particular my horse cruising, he didn't want me on his back, but he was very happy for it to have me on the ground, as they all were. Yeah. But when I left to come back into the house, having been with them, I'd have this amazing serenity and a feeling of peace, which I hadn't had at all. And then amazingly, out of nowhere, I was doing some training with an American woman. She appeared at my home and she said, oh, by the way, I've, I want to introduce you to Dawn Oakley Smith. And this extraordinary woman appeared who did all this equine amazing work. She runs an organization called Hartshaw. And she and I started talking and I said, you know what? I really want to create a brand new model and I'm going to add horses as a key part to bring horses into the prison. It's yeah. never really been done before, but let's do it. So anyway, I put this brand new seven step model together, which I have to say, looking at it was very much probably what I felt was missing in my life when I was younger. And it was a kind of pain free way of releasing your trauma and pain, which I'll come on to in a minute. But the seven stages was very exciting. And I went to New York and I went to the Harlem and then the and the Bronx at the end of 2011. And I brought the model to a load of gang leaders and said to the gang leaders, what do you think of this new model? And they are to a rehabilitation for people who've been in prison and they loved it. They went, oh, my goodness, you got to bring it to New York. Why aren't you doing it here? And I said, well, I've just I think I'm going to start in the UK. So I brought the model back. I to love the, the fact UK. that you went to meet these, these sort of gang leaders out in Harlem. It was amazing. <laughs> Um, and did they give you some interesting insights uh, into the, the, that you could take away and, and integrate into the program? Yeah, I think what they said is keep it real, keep yeah. it practical. And that's what I'm all about, real and practical. And, you know, you've got to remember that, you know, whatever you do, it's got to be quick. It's got to be effective. It's got to be exciting. And they love the horse bit. They said it's got yeah. to be different. Yeah. So, and then I did meet some prisoners who'd been in America. They put people in prison for 60, 70 years. I met one guy who'd just come out on, from a 60-year sentence, and he was extraordinary. I went to see them all doing work placements and stuff and talked about how work, the work ethic is so important, which I believe it is for all of us to have a purpose of some description, keeps you focused in life. And, yeah, this charity, I think, really... A seven step model that you, you, you created it out of everything that you'd learned on your own journey, really, didn't you? Along the way, both in your own internal journey and from the charities you worked in before, it was like the sort of the, the final sort of crucible, right. crucible of everything brought together it is. that you could then share and bring back to to all the, all the young men that you work with, the former offenders. Um, mm -hmm. And so you really you really embody that that uh, that work. I think the, the seven-step model in itself, when I look at it, you know, it's got unlock at the beginning. And that's where we bring horses into the prison. We do music, we do football, we do boxing. We get people to unlock their pain without create, going back into the drama of it. And I think that's really important. The counselling is fantastic, I'm sure, for many. But actually, some people don't want to be, you know, even me discussing the French thing. I don't really bring that up much. I just thought when you asked me, because, you know, going back into your past the whole time sometimes can be more destructive. Yeah. So I'm all about how does the unconscious mind. So I wanted quick tools. So we use a lot of very, very, very exciting, energised tools to let go of pain. And then we bring in mentors, then we do work placements, we bring companies into the prison. We, As we said, we brought the horses in. And we uh, then when they come out of prison, we do the work tasters. So this today, tomorrow, I've got a load of them going into Schroeder's and in London. All sorts of different companies are receiving so tell me, them. So tell, me, tell me what happened the first time you took the horses into the prison. Well, do you know, the, the first time it was unbelievable because I got let into a prison near Bristol called Ashfield and I thought Serco owned the prison, they let me in. I thought I was going to end up with 23 very nice 15 to 18 year olds. What I didn't realise was that I was given the toughest gang leaders in Britain. So when we walked into the prison, they showed us zero respect 
And the trainers I brought with me from the military literally said, let's get out of this prison. This is not working, Eva. And I kept saying, but please wait, wait, wait until the horses arrive. Mm -hmm. Half an hour later, the horses arrive in two horses who went absolutely ballistic. They could smell. They didn't like the smell of what was going on, the energy. Anyway, the, the same prisoners that had shown us no respect, the 15 to 18-year-old young people, they were hiding under their chairs in the gym. They were too scared <laughs> to come out. Brilliant. So that was the breaking point that I needed because these it proved to me they were just like kids, like any children, yeah. and they had fear and all that. So I'm delighted to let you know that many of them I'm still in touch with and it's been a joy. And I am still actually saw the guy today who was the main teacher who put them all on my programme. He now works with our men doing the up at King West in the farm shop here. And he was making burgers with everyone today. And he was the senior man, so he now works around here. So it's wonderful to remind him of what he put me through. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> and, and the horses are really important for helping the men to connect with their feelings. That's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. Exactly. The horse mirrors what's going on inside you as well. Yeah. And they have to sort of feel those, they have to really feel their feelings the feeling and get in touch so with the feelings so that they can move through. That's right. And Absolutely. release their pain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember you telling me, or actually Jamie telling me, he, one of the young men you've worked with, um, how he'd been, he was depressed, wasn't he, about a year ago. And, That's right. And you took him out on the horses and you did some really helpful work with him to help him move through his depression. Can you tell me how, how that worked? Yeah, do you know, it was something I just kind of dreamt on. The, the, the minute we were on the horse, I knew he was in a very, very bad way. We were in the middle of COVID, everyone was in lockdown, and I took him around the roads and I said to him, Jamie, let's get your energy looking more positive. The horse had his head down at one point, and I said, "Come on, put your, you know, get more energy. Look up, think to the future." The minute he did this, the horse started changing its state. And then, as we came back down here, the horse was extraordinary. What was going on with the two of them? I said, "Jamie, now think about the future. What do you really want in your life?" And Carlos, who's just magnificent, leapt in the air and plunged forward like I've never seen. Amazing. And I said, if you haven't got a message, Jamie, you've got a message today from Carlos, which is get on and move move forward, which is exactly what he's doing yeah, now. He's overcome he's really his that, pain. He? He's doing yeah. brilliantly now. Yeah, no, he is. So what do you think, what, what, what are the sort of most important learnings you think you've brought from your own journey into Key for Life? Well, I think there's a lot of learnings, but just to kind of synthesize it into a few points, I think the most important thing you've got to do in life is take personal responsibility. And I think whether it's me taking responsibility or it's the boys who've been in prison taking responsibility, the most important thing is that too many people in this world, we blame everyone for everyone else. We believe that everybody else is the problem and not ourselves. Yeah. So when you're in prison and you've been in trouble, the same with me. It's very easy to say that I'm here because of X, Y, and Z, but actually, in some way, they've contributed to why they're in prison. So I think personal responsibility is really, really important. I think positive actions, these are the values of Key for Life. When I set it up, it's all about looking at your life and trying to take positive actions. But really important to let go. One of our tracks we're doing with Sony at the moment is called Let It Go. And it is about letting it go. You know, the past doesn't serve us anymore. So what we're trying to do is create a bright future for these men. So if they've been in prison, many of our men, some of them have had 100 offences, some have had 30, been in prison 20, 30 times. You've got to show them a new way of doing things in life because whatever you're doing, the results you're getting are not what you want. So we have to kind of Re help them recreate a new future and a brighter future yeah. and that might well mean that they've got to stop drug dealing or whatever it is that they've been doing and start they might be very good at drug dealing why don't they start selling something legally rather than illegally yeah and you've had and a great giving to others is very a, important a, a great kindness. track record as a charity yeah. haven't you for yes. turning these men's lives around and getting them into jobs We've had, you know what, we've had the most amazing track record. I mean, it amazes me because the men we work with are, as, as in Brixton Prison, they tell you, they give me A-wing, so they're the most toughest guys in the prison. No one can work with them. And I think our results, even with Brixton last year, we got amazing a reoffending rate a year later of 9% when the government's rate is 64%. So our average reoffending rate is about 14%. And getting young men into work 
or meaningful occupation is about 60% and the government's rate is 15%. So if you go on a Key for Life programme, you're generally four times more likely to gain some form of work, meaningful occupation training, yeah. and th- four times less likely to reoffend. Which is fantastic. Which is yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's brilliant. hard work. It doesn't yeah. come overnight. And Um, I have a great team of people helping me and mentors and corporates. It's a huge energy of lots of people and um, yourself. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) And, of course, you, you, um, well, the charity Keep Life set up in 2019, the the, the United Flag campaign to encourage businesses to employ ex-offenders and change um, the the perception in the corporate world about uh, employing ex-offenders and and, uh, seeing it as a negative thing. and we have some exciting things coming up, of course, later this year or in September for, about the United Flag. Do you want to tell us about the United Flag and what's coming up? Yeah, well, you know, the United Flag, I feel very, very deeply and strongly about. I had a dream uh, two, three years, two years ago of me getting a flag going all around the world and helping people become um, companies, become a lot more accountable. Yeah. Uh, over half the companies in Britain at the moment will not hire somebody if they have an offending background. So we need to help companies and give them confidence now that this is unacceptable first and foremost, but also help them. So Nile Rogers from Chic uh, in 2019 that launched the United Flag at a wonderful event we had. We then last year were due to be awarding companies, but because of COVID and everything, we've delayed it. So we have now got the first 12 companies. We hope on the birthday of Key for Life, the 22nd of September, we are due to be with some, we hope, some quite high profile people bringing the horses into London and they will be handing the young men will be the flags over to those companies that have won the United flag. So that's stage one. Stage yeah. two is really about then trying to get many, many more companies around the world, around Britain to get that flag out to as many places as we can Yes, and get many more people flying that flag and employing people who would otherwise find it very difficult to be in employment. Yeah. And the other um, exciting, sort of, well, there's several exciting projects going on, but that, that you mentioned Sony, the work with Sony, yes. and of course you've got, uh, it's about, is it about eight of your young men still? Nine, it, nine, nine rappers. Working, yeah. working with some of the Sony uh, That's artists. That's right, and Columbia Records, what they're and together. Columbia yeah. Records to create um, an EP. That's correct. And two um, videos, and there'll be a performance happening or planned to happen on the on the night of the United Flag Absolutely. Award um, event, award ceremony in in September. That's right. Absolutely. So that's really yeah. exciting. Yeah. And we've got and the album. There's going to be two really amazing videos. One was made here in the orchard in the um, cider apple orchard with all our former gang leaders with the, all the rappers, and another one was made in London. So the two videos are yet to be released, but they're absolutely incredible. It's amazing the correlation it seems between sort of um, former former prisoners and uh, great rappers seem to sort of coincide. <laughs> I've been to one of the music shops here and you see all these guys, you know, doing know, their thing, and they're so, they're, they're, so well, many of them are just so, really good at it, aren't they? They're very bright, and I think they just need to channel their energy into the right things rather than the wrong mm. things. So this podcast here, as you know, is called Folly or Blisters, <laughs> um, with the idea. Of, that Joseph Campbell originally had was Folly or Bliss, and he changed it to Folly or Blisters because um, he decided that um, it, well, actually, when you follow your bliss, you you you're, you you don't just go on some wonderful blissful journey following your purpose, and yeah. you're going to meet all sorts of challenges when you follow that true calling, and you have experienced for sure those blisters on the journey. Um, do you think that's a a, a a good mantra? Follow your blisters. Follow your blisters. Yeah, I don't know if I. Yeah, I think it's a very. I think it's very, very, very. I think if anyone thinks they're on this planet and they're going to have an easy ride, I think they'd be. Uh, they would be completely fooled. I think follow your blisters is. I think all those blisters have made me what I am today. Exactly. Yeah. But no, I was listening to Radio Four yesterday, and I heard um, it was a psychology comp- um, program, and I heard uh, a. They were interviewing a schizophrenic and someone who's had, had who has a psychotic, and both of the both of those people, even though they've been through horrendous times mm-hmm. and challenges, that both of them said at the end of the interview that they were glad that they were where they got to and that yeah. their life had changed so much through it and it deepened them so much and they had changed so much 
they were actually grateful for and they wouldn't change it. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's so often true, isn't it? You know, you, you, yeah. we, we can be so afraid of pain and ad- adversity and difficulty, but actually it can be so transforming, actually. Um, I think if you want, when you understand it, it's very yeah. difficult when you're in it still. I mean, yeah. I, when I feel that I'm going into something, it scares me. But I have to say, I think it's educating people. I, I do a lot of healing on people as an aside to the charity. And so I'm always seeing people who are suffering from terrible depression or voices in their head or whatever and it's amazing when you can give people a sort of reassurance that it's okay yeah. the bit that always upsets me most on this planet is when I hear so many people have committed suicide or I just think so people taking their lives is just so tragic particularly because I've been suicidal you know that it is so unnecessary and yeah. that if only the right help is there for people you wouldn't have people probably so many people you know take you know taking their lives at such young ages as well yes what advice might you have for any offenders who might be listening or anyone who's gone off track in their lives who might be wanting a fresh start Mm, that's a good question i think that people need to believe the impossible is possible but it's really about getting yourself into a really positive mind mindset and that doesn't happen overnight but it's baby steps so I feel that you need to if you're really struggling out there you need to start you know with a structure you need to if nothing seems to be working then you would have changed the way you think it all starts with self and you know as I said at the beginning of the interview you've got to take personal responsibility but you do I know a lot of people say but that's very easy to say how do you go about doing that I think baby steps of whether it's going for a run, a walk, doing some meditation, reaching out for help, it needs to be very structured and you need to take those baby steps and then Mm. you can start focusing on bigger goals. But you need to always have goals and you need to keep yourself structured and otherwise you can start losing your way on this planet. Yeah. Um, And I think that for me is, is what's worked for me. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, And what do you do... You know, I know you you have a sort of very busy, probably sometimes very stressful uh, work life, kind of dealing with all the different things you have to deal with and the things that can go wrong working with ex-offenders and so on at, at the worst times. Uh, what do you do to nurture yourself in between? Yeah, very good question. I think riding my horses are beautiful. I Every morning I have a, I'm very strict. I do a, a healing ritual. I go running every morning, early, early with my dogs and I walk so I spend uh, the time I can either with family but also out on my own doing exercise and doing my spiritual practices which seem to just about touch would keep me where I need to be yeah well you certainly seem to always come out smiling no matter what's going on (laughs) (laughs) I know last year was a really tough year (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah, last Um, year was very tough and I know you got an MBE from the Prince of Wales for Mm -hmm. your well, I don't, well what, what, what was it for? Your Services MBA? to the homeless. Services to the homeless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. And then another one last year from the from the sheriff, an yeah. award for from, from the from the county of Somerset yeah. for uh, for the work you do with Key for Life. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and one final question, Eva. If you were going to be if you were going to die in a year's time and you were going to die, what what would you do with that year? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think I would do. I would reach out to the people I probably keep promising myself I want to see all my great friends and people who make me laugh I'd go out and make a real effort to see those people the great yeah. friends that we often yeah. lose contact with yeah I would probably go and do a bit of traveling to a few places that I you know mean a lot to me spend fun time taking maybe the family with me and I think I'd finally something like if the united flag was something I truly believed in I would start um, banging the old drums and telling more people we need help and handing over the baton of maybe what I feel I've learned while I was on this planet and hope that other people might take up a bit of one of my, you know, my mantle or whatever I've learned. Maybe I can help others so I can continue to create a legacy, even if I'm not here. I think that sounds a p- perfect mix of activities and <laughs> use of your time. <laughs> you know me, I like to keep busy, eh? Hey? <laughs> um, Thank you, Ron. So if people want to find out more about Key for Life and what it does, um, the they website on, yeah, is... www.key4, with a number four, life.org.uk. Brilliant. And is there anything else you'd like to add or 
say that uh, well no well i just want to thank you i think you you have done a you have been an inspiration to take you've taken the pr and all telling the story of key for life onto a new level and coming to do the podcast today for me is wonderful i think the, this journey i've been on in my life you've brought to the, the you've you've made me see my world and my life probably in a very different way so i think it's been a very cathartic exercise this podcast so thank you <laughs> and Thanks, to Eva. ike too and thank you very much for, um, yeah, thank you very much for sharing your story um, and sharing Pleasure. everything you've done and been through. It's, yeah, it's been really you. fascinating. Thank, thank you. you for including me. I hope you enjoyed this final episode of the first series of Folly or Blisters. We'll be taking a break now, so stay tuned for details of forthcoming episodes on ConsciousFrontiers.com, where you can subscribe for updates. In the meantime, do check out any interviews you may have missed in the series with thought leaders like Satish Kumar, Sarah Rosenthula, Thomas Moore, Tim Freak and William Bloom on Spotify, Apple, YouTube and other streaming services. Special thanks go to Ike Morland for editing and recording these episodes. Sharing the journeys of those who've lived inspirational lives, this podcast is designed to inspire and guide people to find their true calling and follow it, navigate the challenges arising, and share the best of their evolving skills and experience for the benefit of their communities. So please spread the word and send positive ripples out into the world. Thank you for listening. <laughs>